Dear friends and family in Christ, may you know the rich grace, mercy, and peace of our Savior Jesus Christ. May you know him as your guide and your stay for each and every day. Amen. Please bow your heads in prayer with me. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for your Son, Christ Jesus, whoever goes before us and behind us, who is with us now and forevermore. We pray that he would always be our guide, that he would direct each of the days of our life, that all our days would be an honor and glorify your name. Lord, we do pray that you would lift us up when we fall, strengthen us to again, to again live our lives as faithful servants to you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you remember a time when you jumped out of bed? When you looked forward to the morning because you didn't have to stay in bed any longer? Do you remember a time when exercise was not something you had to do, but something you got to do? Jumping on a bike was a fun thing to do. Do you remember a time when, well, well when, when you ran around and ran around and ran around because you had to get all the energy out? If you're like me, you probably only remember those times. Some of you may still enjoy those times. I know that there are, we at least have a few who like to run around still. But most of you, like me, only remember those times. In fact, most of you, probably like me, move a little slower now than you used to. Maybe your bodies creak a little more than they're supposed to. Well, I'm sure if you're like me, you also remember about the time when you noticed that your body was not as fast or as in shape as it used to be. For me, it happened during my vicarage year. Now, there was this one occasion I remember where I happened to be pretty speedy and ran down a seventh grader who had a football, but that was not the time. It happened a few months later, though. A few months later, Carla and I, we had to take a vacation. A part of your vicarage year, you get one week vacation, and no ifs, ands, or buts, you have to take the vacation, whether or not you're busy. So we went away to this bed and breakfast that was about an hour away from where we lived in Baton Rouge. And we went to this little bed and breakfast, and the first day we did nothing. We sat around. Well, the second day, we weren't about to just sit around and do nothing. I've learned as time has gone on that the, sometimes it's nice to just sit and do nothing, but we were not able to just sit still. So we found out that there was a state park nearby, and we went to the state park, and it was beautiful. Well, we went out, and we s were walking along some of the trails, and th we were stretching muscles that probably hadn't been stretched in some time, but we felt really good. As we were walking these trails, we noticed that there were harder trails, and there were people who were not staying on the trails, but were actually truly hiking, not just walking on the trails. Well, we were feeling so good that we decided we also could maybe go to a little harder trail, maybe get off the beaten path a little bit. Now, how you remember it, I guess, could be different. Carla remembers that I noticed a shortcut. I remember it that we both made the decision, but... What I, both of us remember is the same is that we got to this place where we could neither go up nor down. We were aching. Our muscles were hurting. Our backs were, were in pain. Our arms and our legs could hardly move. And because we're here, you know that we finally figured out which way to go. But truly, it was not after getting several bruises and scratches. As yet, I still had not realized that I was out of shape or that I was getting old. It wasn't until the next morning. You understand, don't you? When we could barely move, we realized perhaps, perhaps we're not as young as we used to be. And I bring that up because I think as you've realized as time has gone on, that it's important to prepare if you're going to exercise, if you're going on a long bike ride, if you're going on a journey, it's important to prepare beforehand. The older you get, the more preparation you need. Your bodies do move a little slower and creak a little more. And so you have to stretch them out a little bit you also realize that maybe you have to recognize some of your strengths and your weaknesses, things you maybe could not previously do. And you also probably know that this is not just in your physical lives, for your physical well-being. This is true of our spiritual lives as well. Perhaps not even the older we get, but how important it is to prepare for our Christian journey. How important it is for us to reflect on what it means to go on this journey with God, to go on this journey with Christ through our lives. The Lenten season, it's meant to mirror our lives. It's meant to give us a small picture of what our lives will be. 
ending up on Easter Sunday or for us the endless Easter when we join our Lord in heaven. But we also know that that path, that journey, that there's a lot of hardship along the way. That there's a lot of difficulties along this path. That this path is no perfect path, no easy path. And it's interesting to me because there are a lot of people out there who intentionally and unintentionally seem to present the message that the Christian path is an easier path, a smoother path, a path that's not nearly as hard as that secular path in the world. You'll even hear preachers who will say this to you, that if you are devoted to God, if you, if you are faithful, God will make your life easy. But that's not exactly what God's Word says, is it? I invite you to turn back to Mark chapter 8. We're going to be looking at this for our sermon today. And listen to Jesus' own words. They seem to really con- contradict that idea that the path will be easy. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Taking up our crosses, denying ourselves, these are not easy commands. These are not requests, but these are commands from Jesus. Denying ourselves, giving in to those pleasures, the temptations, holding back from give, rather than giving in to those. What about taking up our crosses? Taking up our crosses, as we know, involves suffering. We know this because if you read right before that verse, verse 34 there, you see that it talks about how Peter tried to rebuke Jesus. Jesus had just talked about that he must suffer, that he must be rejected, that he must die. And Peter thinking he knew what was best, rebuked Jesus. And Jesus, in turn, said, get behind me, Satan. Because he knew the path he had to walk involved suffering. But truly, it's not the words beforehand that are so convicting. It's the words that follow. Read along with me here. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? And this you don't have printed, but for whoever is ashamed for, of me, And of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Awful convicting, isn't it? Because we hear those words of Christ Jesus and we see that the path that he has commanded us to walk with him is not an easy path. We hear those words of Christ Jesus and it's a path that involves Denying our sinful temptations. It involves taking up our cross. Facing persecution. It involves sharing the message of the gospel to a generation that is adulterous and sinful. In other words, a generation that doesn't want to hear a word you have to say. And not maybe dying, but certainly dying. This does not sound like an easy path to me. This does not sound like a path that we should be putting up on the bulletin board talking about the latest and greatest. But isn't that what a lot of Christians do, intentionally or unintentionally? They want the world to see them as if they have it all together. Maybe some of you have known this before too. You want to share your faith, but you you want to make sure people only see your good side. Your hair is combed and you're, you're bright smiling and everything seems to be going well. But that's what we call false advertising, isn't it? And what happens when you false advertise, when you've realized you've been sold a bill of goods? You get angry or disappointed, frustrated at the very least. I know there was these glass cleaners that someone in our congregation had told me about. And she went on about how they were supposed to be very good. She had heard the good commercials about them. And so I wanted to get some to clean my car. I like to have a clean car, but I don't like to clean it, so... You can see which one wins out if you see my car. But I bought these glass cleaners, and they advertised on the label, no streaks, no lint. So I went out to my car, and I started cleaning the windows. And after two or three of those wipes, I noticed that there were still smudges. So I thought, well, maybe it's because my car is so dirty. So I got into the car, and I started wiping the inside of the windows. Still, lots of lint, still smudged. Finally, I had to use my my old standby vinegar to get it clean, but I was frustrated. Here I had spent the money to buy these wipes because they had promised that they would uh, make my job much easier, that my car would be able to see out the windows. 
I was frustrated and disappointed. Now that's just a small thing, a minute thing really, because now it's dried out and it's still sitting in the garage, but that's not how our faith is, nor is it how our lives are. Because we know when people have misled us, when people have lied to us, when people have sold us a bill of goods in our lives, usually it's much more significant than that, isn't it? And it's much harder for us to forget or forgive. Because in those things, when people sell us a bill of goods, they have a direct impact on the rest of our lives oftentimes. And so when we go to the world, showing them this perfect Christian life, this beautiful Christian life, and then the person realizes that things are not so perfect, so easy, it oftentimes causes hurt and pain, disappointment. Maybe some of you have experienced that as well. Because we know that the Christian life is not one that is easy, is it? It's not one that we'd like to hold up in front of everyone because we know that most of us are sitting in this church for a reason and it's not because we have it all together this morning. It's not because we have our lives perfect so we can be together now. We know that it's because we still have broken lives and broken relationships. We still struggle with aches and pains in our bodies we struggle with aches and pains in our souls. We struggle with the financial difficulties and we struggle with, with trials. And we know that the Christian journey is not an easy one. And so what makes it any different from the journey of the world? Why go on this path? Why be in church? Why go to the effort? Maybe the mantra of the world is to live hard and, 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 or live and die hard or uh, it's better to burn out than to fade away. Maybe they're right. Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever feel like your life is, seems no better or easier than those outside the church door? Those who are doing their errands right now and those who are sleeping in? I know there are a lot of Christians who go through this, who go through the struggles of their lives and they see that and they wonder, is, is this effort really worth it? Is it really any better? Well, there is one difference. One word. Hope. This journey that we're on is a journey of hope. This journey that we're on is not all about our earthly happiness. Waking up 80 years old with the, the strength of a 20-year-old the journey we're on is not one that will mean that every single day of our lives are easy or contented. But what's different is we have hope. We have hope, not in ourselves, but in our Savior, Jesus Christ. We have hope in the promise that this life is not all that there is, that we are not going to stop here, that we are not done here. But we look forward to a future, a future where we are free from pain and suffering free from the rejection of family and loved ones, free from the hurts of this life. Hope, hope that will not disappoint. Paul, he kind of gets right to the point in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. Our hope is not in the things of this world. If it is the case, then our hope is empty. But our hope is in our Savior Christ Jesus, who has given us the promise of the world to come. The promise of a life that is better than this life. The promise of a life free. Truly free. This journey we take, though, it's not meant to be a journey taken alone. But it's meant to be taken with Christ. This journey that we take, it's not to be meant to be taken only by ourselves, but together, and we're going to spend some more time talking about it. But I do want, to think of, want you to think about today. As you go on this journey of life, we do have that message of hope that is meant to be shared. But instead of going to people and showing them a perfect life, that's the temptation of the world to advertise for God. Instead, show them who you truly are. Be honest. Show the world, the wreck or wretch, as you may, whichever you prefer, that you are. Show the world that you are a sinner, that you have broken relationships, that your life is not all together. 
Show them that you are not perfect. Be honest. Now that doesn't mean brag about your sins. But when you're honest, you can show the world a Savior who came to redeem even a poor, sinful being. You can show the world a Savior who, while you were yet a sinner, Christ came for you. Christ came for me. If you are honest, you can show the world a Savior who loves you despite the mistakes you have made, the imperfections of your life. You can show them a Savior who won for you hope by His own precious sufferings and death on the cross. Because that is what this journey of hope is all about. It is a journey to the cross, a journey to the forgiveness of our sins, a journey to the promise of salvation. But it is a journey that does not stop at the cross, but points us even further to the resurrection, that Jesus Christ did not remain in the tomb, but that He conquered death and the grave, that He overcame the power of sin, death, and the devil, and that He has given us the same promise, that we too shall overcome sin, death, and the devil, and we shall rise with Him. This journey is not an easy one, but it is a simple one. It's simple because God gives to us all that we need to do. Trust in Him. He gives us His Word, which gives us His plan, which gives us the plan of salvation, a roadmap for our lives, a Word that always points us to the cross, not to ourselves, but to Jesus, to Jesus, to the hope and promise of our salvation. May the Lord guide you and direct you this day May he, the Lord guide you and direct you each of your days that you may know that on this journey of life that we are journeying to hope, the promise of our salvation. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we do give thanks to you that even in the midst of our trials, even in the midst of our temptations, that you are always with us. We give thanks to you that you have sent your Son, Christ Jesus, to be the hope in this hopeless world, to be the promise in this world full of broken promises. Lord, we pray that You would forgive us for those times when we, when we get caught up in trying to show others that our lives are perfect. Break down the facades that we show. Rip away those veils that others may see our weakness too, but not as weakness, but know that we are strengthened by You. Use us, O oh Lord, that as we travel on this journey to show others the promised salvation to show others your love, to show others that when we are weak, you are strong, to show others that you are the true hope. Now may your peace, which is beyond all understanding, guard and keep us. In Jesus' name, amen.